have um, Julia Hardacre, who's come all the way from the NT, and a lot of the conference is not really um, suitable for Julia, and yet we really appreciate the fact that she comes all the way down here to share what is happening in the NT, because obviously it's not a highly urbanised environment and there's a huge um, need for different approaches. So we're very grateful. We always really enjoy hearing about what's happening um, in the Northern Territory because it is so different and so needs so much work. So thank you very much for coming, Julia, and welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me back. Um, I'll just do a test run so I know how to work this, yes. First of all, I'd like to thank um, Joy and Silvana for um, uh, inviting me along and, um, and I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land um, upon whom we meet today and over these few days. Uh, as Joy said, yes, sometimes uh, when I come along to this conference, I often feel like I've been beamed in from Mars. <laughs> uh, the setting in which uh, we're used to working is so incredibly different um, to working in urban areas. Some of the issues are the same. Some of the ways we go about things are the same, um, but very few of those um, are, are similar. We have to take a very different approach. Um, so I thought what I'd do, first of all, is um, maybe let those of you who don't know anything about Emmerich, and I have been cheeky enough to run around pop some brochures on tables, which might help. Um, who are we? Uh, Emmerich is a not-for-profit organisation. We're based in Darwin. Uh, we work nationally, and we're made up of a, of a board and uh, a small team of people, five of us, and, and our members who are very important to us and our members come from across all our stakeholder groups um, with a growing um, membership interest from the health profession. So we are finally making it, we believe, when we're starting to get the health profession interested in dogs in remote communities because it's not rocket science to work out the links between dogs and humans. Our vision is communities that are healthy and safe for people and their companion animals. And just to quickly tell you, because I love this little story, those little puppies um, came from Jigalong in WA when we were there doing a program. And uh, for those of you who saw the movie Rabbit Proof Fence, it was made around the story of the sisters from Jigalong who returned there. And these little sisters were surrendered to us by an old lady and they were so beautiful we couldn't euthanise them. Um, one of the puppies uh, now happily lives with my grandson and granddaughter um, and one of the other little puppies as we speak is on the Kerry Ann show with Dr Michael Archnell, her vet who's on there, who's telling the story today um, about his experience in Utopia with us last week. So one of those little puppies there is Woundy and Woundy's starring right now <laughs> and unfortunately I'm speaking right now, I can't watch it. <laughs> Uh, quickly, what do we do? Uh, so we work with, not for, communities um, to manage and improve the health of their pets uh, to help achieve our vision, which we know very clearly is the vision of communities as well. Uh, we work to build the capacity of all levels of government, um, from the federal government right down to the individual standing there in front of you. Um, AMREC's best practice guidelines and model has been adopted by the federal government and underpins um, a lot of programs that are currently being rolled out nationally that are funded by the federal government. Um, we're linked to research. Um, research is really important to us because we need to know what all those um, you know, um, links are between human health and dog health. It's not only a huge part of how we go about our work, uh, it's important for funding and it's mostly important so that people on the ground understand um, how you know, sick and unhealthy uh, dogs uh, affect their daily lives. Education and training is um, becoming uh, our second hugest thrust of our work um, and uh, it, it's not uh, an easy task because as I was saying to someone a minute ago uh, from Animals Australia, I'm sorry I've just forgotten your name, um, Unlike in, a, in, in an urban area of New South Wales, you can make up a brochure or a poster or something in English and out it goes. Everyone can get it. In Manangrita, for instance, there are 15 language groups. 
English is a sixth, fifth, sixth, seventh language for a lot of people in remote communities. So no one size fits all and it is not appropriate to deliver one education message in one community and go deliver it in another. They may have very, very different cultural beliefs there. So having one education officer for the entire Northern Territory um, is quite a challenge for us. <laughs> We contribute to policy across all levels and we advocate um, for Aboriginal people when we're asked to. So how do we go about our work? Um, Jeff touched on this yesterday and it's really lovely to meet Jeff and, and hear about um, his work uh, on the um, working with the um, native people. Thank you. I've been on reservations. I just had a senior moment. That's all right. And, um, and just you know, picking up all those similarities. Um, so it's really good, you know, I don't feel like an alien today at this conference. Uh, it's really, really important that we are respecting cultural traditions and certainly the right of the communities to manage their own animals. We go and work in community by invitation. So if a white fellow rings us up from the Shire or a councillor somewhere and says, will you come and do this? We will go there, but the first thing we do is go and meet with the elected council or the traditional owners or elders. If they don't want us there, we're gone. Uh, so far, that's never happened. But if it did, we, we wouldn't be um, working in that community. Um, our programs need to be really signed off in some way, even if not formally, by the elected councils and elders. So it's really about grassroots collaboration, consultation and planning and um, yeah, working with what the communities see are their priorities, not ours. And their communities are often very different to the, uh, the priorities of the Shire, you know, so there's, there's a big gap there. And we like to see that um, as an independent organisation, you know, we're not government, we're not regulatory, um, that, that sometimes we can be that bridge uh, between law and culture and find a way to all work together. We really learn from past mistakes. We have to. Um, Top-down approach, we have seen, has never worked. Um, the federal government and the Northern Territory government has spent endless millions of dollars um, over all of the years trying to clean up dogs in remote communities. And we still have pretty much the same problem. A lot of progress is being made, um, but not a lot gets changed. You know, nothing changes when nothing changes. So it's really important that we learn from those past mistakes. We see uh, residents and vets working together, um, not just a, a vet coming into a community and being, you know, taking the same sort of top-down approach um, that they've been employed to do. So AMRIC member vets are very um, mindful of that to actually take a really consultative, gentle approach to work with people and that's how things get done. Um, we see ourselves as partners and we act as though we are partners and that's um, a really important way uh, for views, uh, each other's views to be heard um, and, you know, that way then we have a path forward. Whilst we may be the experts, if you like, in the um, you know, knowledge of um, zoonoses or disease or whatever, um, I see, you know, when I sit under a tree with an old lady that she's an expert too. And I can say, you know, what, what do you think are the issues here in your community around dogs? And I can tell you, 99 times out of 100, she'll say, our sick dogs are making our kids sick. That's the first thing, you know, and then follow all the other issues. So it's important that we take that holistic one health approach to, to achieve change. We really love to work with our member vets who are deeply, deeply committed to this work. Um, as you can see, that photo there of Steve Cutter, that was taken on Gallowinku at 10 o'clock at night. Now, Steve, is um, his, his kin family is from Gallowinku. They trust him, they know him. He turns up and all hell breaks loose. Everybody's coming to him, you know, to, to get their dogs um, spayed and neutered and treated. Yeah, um, I thought we'd look just for a second, you know, the facts are dogs and, as I said, the odd brave cat that could live in a community um, is integral to the fabric of community life. And the health and treatment of dogs is intrinsically linked to community health and wellbeing overall. You know, a lot of, lot of old people, when we've gone into a community for the first time, there's a lot of sick dogs around. 
they say, you know, these sick dogs make us feel sick. We don't feel good inside when it's like this. But treating desexing uh, and euthanising dogs is a real challenge for us, depending on where we are. So I thought I'd better explain that. Why is it a challenge in some of those areas? There's evidence that the dingoes came across with the macassans um, around 4,000 or so years ago, um, brought over um, into uh, northeast Arnhem Land and down through some of the islands off West Arnhem Land. And um, they became they became members of families in some way. So Aboriginal people, and I'm no expert on this, and if there's someone in the room that is, you know, please ask questions or fill people in better at the end. But um, they, they became part of the family and there's evidence of um, dingoes bringing food into camp, you know, and even though they were part of the family, they didn't belong to, they weren't owned. They were just there as part of that, as part of that family or community. And the dog dreaming tract, sort of, if you know the Northern Territory, sort of comes down off uh, sort of Gallowinku and into Arnhem Land and it extends over to Borroloola on the east coast and then it tucks back down through the Barkley, down through Ali Karang and then across and up into the Uindamu area and back down into the desert area and sort of seems to sort of fade out somewhere down into the APY lands of South Australia. So along that line, we find there's very, very traditional um, beliefs around dogs and um, that they ask, they are kin, they have family name. Uh, pups are given in ceremony um, at the time, you know, when boys are being um, fixed up at 13 in ceremony. Um, Sam, we're using the word fixed up. Um, and, um, you know, and so therefore, you know, that, that holding of that knowledge is still a really big part. And it's a pretty challenging thing when you go out to a community and you're seeing a dog that's been run over for a, with a car and it's got severe compound fractures or a broken back and it's dragging its back legs, as some of you may have seen on the press last week. Um, and we go to the old fella and he says, can you fix up my dog? And, and we say, you know, like we're operating off the back of a ute. Like we don't have the facility to fix up your dog other than to humanely euthanise it. And he says, no, he's special spirit dog. You have to let him die natural way. And we can't do anything about that. And if we tried to, if we forced it on that guy to euthanise that dog, we may well never be invited back to work in that community again. So they're really hard decisions for vets to make. And in fact, um, I've been adopted into a family in the Barclay and my skin name is Napangadi. And when I was working out in this community and the ladies found out that um, my skin family is from the Barclay and that my name is Napangadi, everywhere I drove in that community over that week, this dog here, Jumba Numba, he had to sit in the front with me because he's my brother. <laughs> and Jumba Jimba would come over at night to visit me and so Jumba Jimba's my brother and that's how it works. Some of the challenges to working uh, remotely uh, lack of access to services, vets are a million miles away and um, as I was saying earlier, like if, if you're in Kintore, uh, which is 580 k's um, west of Alice Springs and uh, on, the, on the WA border, along roads like that, um, and you have got, you know, a big mob of dogs because they're breeding like rabbits and you want to get that dog uh, desexed. Uh, you have to drive 580 k's and then go to the vet in town and pay $380 and then have the dog hospitalised overnight and then drive back. And that's just for one dog out of the 30 that are in your yard. Um, do you think it's going to happen? No. Um, also under the Northern Territory Emergency um, Intervention, under that Act, people's salaries are quarantined and income managed and those, um, the, their money is available for basic, you know, basic needs. So that's food, clothing, schooling, not that that costs much, but, um, and fuel. So as you can see, um, accessing a vet is way down the list of priorities. Um, yeah, so the frequency and duration of veterinary visits is another issue. Uh, currently the Northern Territory Government um, divided uh, the Northern Territory into nine super shires and those shires have a responsibility for animal management. Um, their budgets are this big, nearly, 
for that. Um, and for those that are, you know, do focus on this area, um, they are often highly underskilled people who, who've never done this before. They don't know about dogs, they don't know about relationships, they don't know about Aboriginal people and there they are trying to get a program going. So sometimes the best they can do is tick the box by sending a vet out once or twice a year for a few days. Distance is always a huge issue with our work. Uh, communicating, very often we don't have access to um, our uh, mobile phones or um, to internet. <coughs> very basic facilities. This is a Rolls-Royce facility. This is the Man and Greta veterinary suite that gets set up twice a year on some crates and doors. And, uh, and I would say that um, Ted's been going there for eight years now and, and I'd say it's one of the most sophisticated uh, that I've seen in a community. Um, and challenges like this, you know, often I, we've, been, we've been doing surgery just under a tin roof or something and when you get these big dust whirly whirlies come up, you know, try to keep everything clean and keep doing surgery. It's interesting. Um, here, uh, out in an outstation, you can see Jan and Steve there operating, doing a fairly big thing. It's an eye ablation on one end of the back of the ute and Jan's doing a castration on the other end. Uh, under a house, that's pretty good. <laughs> out in the open at outstations, you can see those blue doors and crates again. They just got loaded up and taken around. Very often, though, um, by the t these are the sorts of dogs that we get handed to desex. Um, but we see that that's like 20 puppies that just didn't hit the ground, horrible as it is. We get lots of candidates for desexing, and um, <laughs> uh, in many areas of the Territory, um, Jesus rode in on a donkey, so donkeys are sacred in some areas, and the three wise men came in on camels, so camels are sacred. Uh, pigs are regular members uh, of the household, especially up in eastern um, and West Arnhem Land and the Tiwis. Um, everybody has different pets. You can see the owner there very carefully watching on to what Steve's doing. Um, horses on Palm Island, and I'll add that in for you, Jeff. We'll desex anything with a heartbeat too. <laughs> uh, literally. Yeah, so what are some of the issues that we face out there? You can see this dog here whelping you know, in the rubbish in the litter. Um, ringworm, um, you know, dogs that uh, are, are very savage. We see lots of scolds um, on dogs. That's often a way of disciplining is throwing boiling water. The impact of zoodoses. Um, you know, this family here in their shower recess, I said, uh, how's everyone having a bath while this, you know, bitch and her puppies are here? And I said, well, when will you move them out so you can all have your shower? You know, it's hard. And she said, you know, it's a cheeky one. When we go near that mother, it'll bite us, you know. So uh, we know who rules the house in some places. Um, malnourished, sick and dying dogs, as I said, are real animal welfare issues. Um, getting those sorts of dogs um, sometimes surrendered for euthanasia or for treatment uh, is not always easy. This is uh, something, um, uh, transmissible venereal tumour, that's all too common in the Northern Territory. And, um, you know, sadly, it, it's so easily treatable by desexing the dogs. Um, you know, if, if they're not uh, mating, uh, we don't see that. And, of course, the biggest issue for, uh, of all is the overpopulation of dogs from just totally uncontrolled breeding. And, uh, as I said, you know, if you're going to drive 580 k's to get your dog desexed, that's not going to happen. And um, for those of you who may or may not know, um, the dingo traditionally moved in a pack of five. You know, the dominant bitch had two pups a year. If any of the other bitches had pups, she ate them. They controlled their own, uh, you know, regulated their own breeding. Um, they fed themselves, watered themselves, cared for themselves, hunted. Totally, totally independent. Then along comes us, you know, a couple of hundred years ago and we bring these dogs in and as we all know, you know, in the first six months, you know, you can have hundreds of puppies on the ground and in the second part of the year, you know, those puppies are breeding and putting them on the ground. So it is an endless problem and communities tell us all the time that they just feel utterly overwhelmed with all these dogs running around. And um, fences are very rare um, in communities. 
Um, usually the school might have a fence or the clinic might have a fence, but other than that, houses aren't fenced. So the dogs are running around, they're free roaming, they're very well socialised. Um, <laughs> and they all know their pecking order, that's for sure. Um, but it's pretty scary, you know. It's scary for Aboriginal people too and it means they can't walk around their communities safely. They'll only drive from the house to the clinic. So, you know, that's not good for exercise and diabetes and all those other things. So, you know, this overpopulation has a massive impact in, in many, many ways, not just on the poor dogs who are all trying to scavenge for something to eat or whatever. But we can provide a means of managing large uncontrolled dog populations um, through desexing programs, you know. Duh. <laughs> we all know that. Um, this was one morning in Kintor and it was really cold and one of the old ladies went over and bought a blanket over for all the dogs. So they do care. These ones were all coming from surgery. So what are some of our other challenges? Uh, funding, you know, um, duh, that's what we all are here for too, all trying to find money to do what we do. Um, and it's, it's often very spasmatic, spasmodic, um, very knee-jerk a lot of the time and, uh, and very thin on the ground in the Territory. Political will, um, often again it's only when things make the headlines or whatever. Huge skills deficit in the shires, you know, to be able to work in this particular field. Um, lack of cultural awareness, history, racism. You know, you should see, you know, the Northern Territory News, which, as you all know, is a very salubrious newsletter. Um, <laughs> they're now running a regular little column every day where it says, on dogs, or, you know, on the GST or whatever the thing is, but on dogs has been now going for many, many months. And you should see some of the comments that get put in there. They're just unbelievably ignorant and racist. And we, that is all day, every day. <clears throat> This, as some of you may have seen, um, was on the front of the paper, um, I think, last week. And um, this is um, not an uncommon scene. We see a lot worse than this, but this is not an uncommon scene in a lot of communities. If the vet's only coming twice a year, then this is what you get. Because who's delivering the parasite control treatment in between? And as I said, you know, attitudes, if you read the sign on the bottom there, this was one put out on the 8th of the 8th or the 11th, just recently. The vet will be at Nirapi next Monday. The number of dogs need to reduce on a community. The mangy dogs need to be destroyed. If you hide your dogs from the vet, I will have the police shoot your dog. Please help clean up the community in this matter. Can you imagine that going on a street sign in Potts Point? Can you imagine an Aboriginal per person walking into the Gold Coast, into your backyard, and saying, we don't like your dogs, we think you've got too many, and we're going to shoot them? Can you imagine the outcry? But this goes on all day, every day in the Northern Territory. I'm telling you, it does in many areas. So many communities, unfortunately, miss out on support and resources to enable the numbers, health and welfare to be improved or managed. And um, I'm sad to say that the NT is many years behind other states. The, uh, Queensland, WA and New South Wales have long recognised all those links between human health, dog health, environmental health, the welfare of dogs, etc, etc, and have put decent resources and money channelled in through health, down through environmental health and out into partnerships with shires and councils to employ animal management workers and environmental health workers. That's not happened in the Northern Territory. <coughs> Until now. <laughs> And that's mainly what I want to talk to you about to, because you've all been talking about different approaches to programs and desexing and, you know, uh, improving the situation. And, um, you know, we're very fortunate um, that the Aboriginal Benefits Account has just made a major investment in AMRIC um, uh, to fund a, a program over the next three years. And we'll be undertaking this program in partnership with a few of the shires. Unfortunately, it's not enough to do, you know, the big picture, but we need to start somewhere. Um, we're currently in negotiations. Uh, we only got signed off in 10th of August, so we're, you know, just really getting this up and started. Um, we've based this um, pretty much on the same model as Queensland upon their good advice. And... Um, and this will be to undertake a truly grassroots approach from the ground up, uh, which I'll explain. There's been a real demonstrated need for this project and, um, you know, we're sad that the Northern Territory Government hasn't picked it up and done it, but what we're really hoping to do from this is at the end of the three years, so we haven't started it yet, and my brain's three years ahead going, how are we going to make this sustainable? 
Um, and you know what we're hoping to demonstrate is that this this approach does work. That we get a lot more dogs desexed. We do get the numbers stable. You know we do improve the situations in communities through this approach, and then hopefully we'll get the political will behind it to keep it going. Vets well understand the value of having local trained people. And so what we're trying to do is to create, I'll just come back, I should have said this before that statement, but um, what we're trying to create here is um, um, 10 to 12 jobs for Aboriginal people who live within their own communities, um, who know their communities, know their people, who will be trained, mentored and supported by AMRIC but they will be employees of the Shire, and that's the partnership um, for infrastructure and other purposes. And, um, and, you know, as I said, only just rolling it out. Um, you know, vets value these guys. They make the just the world of difference to a program. We've, we've heard stories, um, you know, of vets going out to communities. Um, they've been invited in there. They've never been there before. And it's not entirely their fault, but they get there and they set up a little surgery suite and stay there for the week and nothing really happens except a few white fellas turn up. So, you know, we, we're really keen to see that vets who go and work in communities actually know how to go about that. It's quite unique work. Um, it's very different to being in a practice in Canberra. Um, so these guys here make the vets' jobs so much easier. Um, they, as you, oh sorry, as you can see there, um, there's, there's so many things that they can be doing. So before the vet even arrives in the community, these guys have been around, they've advertised for weeks and weeks and they've got a surgery list waiting so that when the vets come in, they're just standing there, spaying and neutering, you know, day in, day out, churning them over as, while these guys are ferrying them to and from um, surgery suite. Um, we've been undertaking training up in the Tiwi Islands with these guys, that's Sophie, our education officer there, who's also a veterinarian, um, for, for a long time, and they have been able to keep um, the dogs in a much better state up there, despite criticisms from the outside. We see what the change has been. So this project, as I said, is currently being negotiated with um, four shires, and uh, yeah, I won't reveal who they'll be just yet because uh, they're all in negotiation. Part of our role will be to get that skills base going with these guys so that we give them on the ground training, mentoring and support um, on, you know, as, regular, as regularly as we can. Finding people also within the community who want to be part of that project, so identifying other stakeholders that can also put in the support for them. Um, we, I'll talk about the edu um, RTO training in a second. We find that they're just so keen, like this guy here, um, he's actually castrating his own piglet <laughs> Un under supervision, you know, and there's, I didn't put the next photo in, but he's standing there with his little pig up after that, you know, kissing it on the snush. He was so proud of what he'd done under supervision and, um, you know, ran around gathering up everybody's piglets and everybody's puppies and bringing them over to be castrated. So, you know... Um, it's, it's just a really, it's how, it's how it should be done. So they can assist with surgeries, preparation for surgeries, as I said, engaging people, preparing all the surgery lists, interpreting. You know, how do you go work in Manangrida, for instance, where there's 15 language groups, unless you've got local people who can go around and do that. And because they see that the vet's got a good heart and he's doing the right thing and he's not killing the dogs and he's making them better and, and they can tell the story about, you know, when your dog's desexed, it's going to get fatter and shinier and healthier and it's not going to be quite as aggressive and it's more likely to stay around your house and it's a really good thing to do. That word of mouth um, will just grow the surgery list overnight. Because without that, you know, the vet's then got to go door to door to door and do it himself. And that's a pretty hard sell and it's a real waste of vet dollars, we see. You know, the vet's better off with the scalpel. Um, that's not to say that he shouldn't have a relationship with the community at all. Um, that certainly needs to be there. But um, these guys are the key. 
And as I said, that certainly achieves a greater engagement in desexing. We're currently negotiating with Bachelor Institute of Tertiary um, Indigenous Education uh, to create, uh, there currently isn't a course um, that we need for these guys over the next three years, so we're currently designing one. And um, Bachelor, we're, we're very hopeful that that will go through to the highest levels and get signed off for these guys so that we actually create a, um, a course uh, for animal management. The reason why we like to keep it sort of local is that these guys need to come together on really regular occasions so that they network, they talk to each other, they get support from each other, they can talk about what's happening in their community and they can have that you know, opportunity to um, stay engaged. And staying engaged is a real challenge too. You know, very often we've had guys who we've gotten involved with us on a, on a program and they're really keen and they love it and we talk about when we're going to come back and, um, you know, we get out to the community and um, we say, where's Fred? And Fred's in jail or Fred's away on sorry business or Fred's family had a big fight with him and he for cultural reasons, can't be here anymore, etc. So keeping these guys engaged is really going to be our biggest challenge so that we're trying to put in as many supports around, um, around them as possible and also to get them some formal and accredited training. Um, community education and awareness, knowledge sharing programs are key to this program being successful as well. And um, we see these guys as the link so we see that maybe we can be a help and a conduit of uh, resources and um, ways to go about making them, uh, but we really want to see these guys in between the veterinary visits um, having education as a key thrust of what they do. So really simple little programs with the kids at school or going over to aged care or you know, putting things up or running video nights in the community or whatever. And, um, and as I said, you know, education is, is uh, really tricky. There's no, there's no one way here. And we find that when um, a community sits down and works together to make up their own story, their own posters, their own resources, with their own photographs of people from their own community in it, they have a whole lot more relevance, you know, than something, you know, put up. At the, at the local, you know, shire building or something else about their dogs. And, uh, you know, recently, I didn't put it in this presentation, but there was a poster last year put out uh, by some well-meaning police in a community um, who stuck up this sign of a whole bunch of aggressive dogs that are obviously owned by white fellas. They're white fellow dogs, um, you know, snarling and snapping and carrying on. And, um, and, and it was about the act you know, the Animal Welfare Act, and it said, if you have a dog in your yard and you don't feed it, you're going to be fined $5,000 and if, a, you know, if blah, blah, blah. And it's all, all about these fines. And um, I was out in this community at the time and I went around and I said um, to some of the ladies in the groups, hey, what do you reckon about the sign? And they said, oh, that's for white fellas. <laughs> and I said, no, it's for you black fellas. And she said, no, it's not them white dogs and I said no they're for you they're telling you that they're going to fine you if you have a dog in your yard that you don't feed and they all just looked at each other and burst out laughing <laughs> at any one moment there could be a hundred dogs in your backyard because there's no fence so you know it totally totally off the wall way to go about doing education and getting people <laughs> engaged so um, and even when you develop a resource that looks like it's okay. So I was explaining to someone earlier, you know, um, Sophie made up this book about a little lonely dog, you know, running around the community and it's lonely and it's frightened and it's alone and, and a little boy comes along, picks it up and takes it home and, and it's sitting there under the moon and it's howling and blah, blah. Even to read that book in a school, we have to go to the... We usually go to the um, Aboriginal school teachers, the school aides, um, and, and say, what do you think of this? Or get some traditional owners to look at it. Because in one community, that little dog howling under the moon may mean it's lonely and it's scared. In another community, it may mean that it's heralding the forthcoming death of someone, and so that's not okay. Um, in another community, it might mean someone's already died 
and that's not the way, you know, that we talk about someone's death or whatever. So, you know, uh, that's why um, education is such a challenge because there's just no one-size-fits-all. And, um, you know, and we want to do it right. So it's really important too that we support the cultural values such as empathy, care and respect for animals. And when you look at a dog like that one on the newspaper, I mean, from the outside it's really easy to look at that and go, well, check that dog, you know. Aboriginal people just don't care about their dogs if they let them be like that. And we find that's not the case at all. Um, you know, you go and try and do something to a dog in a community and the owner will appear. <laughs> Um, nine times out of ten, you know, the owner will appear. Someone owns that dog. Um, but when you can't even buy dog food or a flea collar or something from your community store because the store owner looks out there and sees all the dogs and says, look at them all, nobody cares about these dogs here. Why would I put dog food and flea collars in my shop? And I say, why don't you try putting, you know, flea collars and dog food in your shop and see who buys it? And so that's another part of our thrust in education is getting uh, the stores across the remote communities to actually put some products in and guess what? They sell. Um, obviously we have to run a campaign, an education campaign, if you put a flea collar in because we have to show people how you use it. But it's important to get those um, values across and shared with kids about empathy, care and respect. Um, because uh, Jeff brought up a really good point yesterday and it's something that's part of our work is, um, you know, if someone's beaten on their wife, they're beaten on their dog. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, we have such uh, high levels of violence in communities um, and we see high levels of violence perpetrated on animals too. And I got a call from Groot Island last week from a distressed school teacher saying, you know, there are about 15 boys out here all in their late teens and they're spear practising on a whole bunch of dogs. So, yeah, breaking, breaking that cycle of violence is part of the way in which, um, you know, we go about delivering our school programs. And obviously, um, you know, keeping kids and people safe from dog bites is really important when you've got, you know, dogs running around everywhere. Um, it's a real issue. And uh, it's important that we get that message across. Rounding me up. Thank you. That's fine. Um, we want to see that people are adequately resourced to care for their animals. So that's from the community store to the um, animal management workers being trained up in basic first aid uh, to having, you know, appropriate resources that show people um, how to care. So what we hope to achieve on this project is a respectful, effective and appropriate long-term change for better care of and reduced numbers of animals in communities. And we can't do this unless we do it through partnerships. Everyone, everyone in a community needs to play a role. Even though the Aboriginal people might own those dogs, um, you know, we all have to play a role. So employment and upskilling opportunities, um, fewer and more valued and cared for dogs is certainly a goal, building safer communities, community pride, as I said, you know, when people have got good, shiny, healthy dogs that stay close to home, they feel happy about that. Dogs are everyone's business. So we want to go from this to this. You know, it's a pretty simple um, message and certainly a very challenging one for us to achieve. And as I said, we're just starting out on this big project. Um, AMRIC's been going for a lot of years, doing a lot of other things, but this is the biggest thing that we've ever taken on. So if any of you are religious, you might keep us in your prayers or your thoughts or your whatever, because we're going to need it. It's not going to be an easy project to um, undertake. Um, but we certainly are going to give it our best shot because uh, we see that this is the real way forward. Thanks.